Hey guys, this video is sponsored by Ibble. Make sure you guys download the app, follow me, and talk to me on there. Hey guys, welcome back to the Blair White Project. So one of the things that I have been super consistent on with both my main channel and the podcast now is this need that I feel to highlight the stories of detransitioners. These are people that are not platformed by the corporate press in any way, shape, or form, unless it's a few times on Fox News, but that's about as far as it's going to go. Um, and they're really important stories, I feel, not only to detransitioners. It's important, obviously, for those stories to be told, but as well for trans people to hear it. I have learned so much in these conversations. You guys remember Shapeshifter was on, and I've had several people on the main channel. But today, we have Richie. And this is day number two, Richie, because we had some tactical difficulties when we filmed yesterday, and it didn't record. So welcome Hi. back. Thanks, Blair. Thank you so much for having me back on. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you again. I'm glad we got a trans story record because, um, as I was saying just before we went live there, you know, you always think back to the things you've said and you're thinking, oh, God, I wish I said that differently. I said that differently. Right. So more than happy to go again and uh, hopefully I won't ramble it as much this time. But, no, uh, I loved your rambling. I learned so much from your rambling. We're going to learn even more today. So... How about we start with, you and I heard it yesterday, we're going to hear it again because it's still interesting, sort of the general backstory of your detransition story. Yeah. So at the moment, I am still detransitioning. Um, it is, it's not a straightforward and long process. There's a lot of complications, which we'll get into. Um, I began detransitioning, like changing my name, presenting um, in March. March, April um, this year. So it's only been about nearly six months since I came out as D-Trans uh, and started the detransition process. Um, I've been on HRT since 2014. I'm still on estrogen, but I am looking to change that. And we can talk more about that later. Um, I only had, I had laser hair removal like everyone else kind of does but i also had um what's often referred to as bottom surgery um but it's a penile inversion with scrotal graft it's quite a brutal surgery um and that has left me with a lot of lifelong complications uh complications that some of which i was aware of but not completely uh not on the scale that i've experienced and i thought it was just a a one-off or it'll get better sort of thing but what I found is post um, post recovery I was kind of abandoned by the gender clinic and just kind of left to my own devices so I started looking around and trying to discuss this online and uh, just found closed doors and like especially in trans communities and trans spaces um, because a lot of trans people are very worried that this will get weaponized against them um, and I understand that. So um, what happened with me eventually is I found the D-Trans community on Reddit, um, which is a peer support group for people who are looking to or questioning their own transition. Um, and that's where I met quite a lot of other detransitioners and we've talked in the background. There's quite a few support groups going on in there. And um, that was quite monumental to me because it was very much the case that I was kind of looking for the permission to do transition because I had a great deal of shame as well about me um about my own transition and the choices that I made but ultimately what I kind of it wasn't just the surgery I think I was trying to pull back before that too um but more and more I just kind of felt less myself and more someone else and I realized something was wrong and when I started speaking to the first time I spoke to a detransitioner, um, like a male who had been through what I'd been through, um, that's that's what really, really changed everything because he said something to me and it stuck with us so much. He said, I was waking up every day and I just thought to myself, I just can't do this anymore. And I was like, God, that's so that's exactly exactly how I feel. It was just I was exhausted. I was exhausted from putting on the voice, the walk, the clothes and the makeup, whatever. I mean, towards the end, before I even detransitioned, everything was just going off. Like um, mm. 
off on the wayside, you know, stopped makeup completely and didn't give a shit about how I looked. And I just, and I knew it just wasn't working for me. And I accept, sure, it works for, for people, works for yourself, I'm sure. Um, but for me, it's whenever we speak out, we're always expected to say, yeah, but transition's fine. Transition works for some people. And I'm thinking, why should we? Why, sh why do I have to give this positive slant on everything all the right. time? And when people who transition and celebrate their transition never once say, oh, yeah, but there are also people who detransition. It's like one rule for me, but not for thee, you know? Um, double standards completely. But again, there's another long winded response. <laughs> Uh, how I kind of got here. Um, I obviously no one really plans to to go viral and like that. I had no idea me me thread would go viral when that did go viral. Um, and it was read out on the Matt Walsh show, and there was a lot of media interest on the back of that too, because um, it captured quite a lot of people before that. It was just in a relatively small, a few thousand followers, less than two or three thousand it was a very very small group of mainly gender critical rad femmes detransitioners and um, parents of oral gd kids you know it was a very very contained group and um i tweeted that out of kind of a bit frustration because i felt like the conversation wasn't really moving along and i just kind of felt like this is an area of attention uh that we all need and we all deserve especially when it comes down to the research and the effectiveness and the long-term implications which we'll get into further but uh yeah well this is one of the things that i appreciate so much about your online presence and others that are sort of popping up in this detrans community and sphere and gaining followings based on sharing their stories one of the things that i really appreciate is that you guys in my opinion help trans people just as much as you help detrans people and the general population in the sense of you're educating people on things that there has previously been a huge and still is a huge incentive to hide information that is hidden from both trans people and detrans people and people who are supporting either or and don't really truly know what they're supporting because there's so much information that is censored. Yesterday we had this conversation about how um, early onset dementia is something that can happen when you're on cross sex hormones, HRT, estrogen for too long as a trans woman. And I did not know that. That's something you literally told me for the first time. And as someone who's been, you know, on these medications for now almost seven years, I would hope that I would have a doctor somewhere along the way that would have told me that. I've had several, hasn't happened. So you guys are actually such a positive force in the community. And that's why it baffles me so much that there is this expectation for me to deny you guys a platform, to hate you guys, to see you as a threat or some sort of force that is leaning towards taking away my rights or my autonomy as a person. I just don't see it that way. And I struggle to see it that way. Why am I expected to hate you, Richie? Why? Uh, that's a good question. I would say a lot of that is just peer pressure bully tactics because mm -hmm. people have on 100% um, standing on a foundation and framework that has been irrecoverably proven because it simply hasn't. So let's go and touch on the dementia rabbit hole. So um, what a lot of people don't realize is, first of all, dementia itself refers to general cognition um, decrease. So that's like, you know, your memory loss, your, your lack of motor function, your everyday tasks sort of thing. Now, Alzheimer's is a specific disease of the brain where your brain cells don't essentially rejuvenate, they shrink and they die. So you essentially lose um, access to bits of your brain and it just doesn't know what to do and it selects random bits. Now, what what a lot of people um, seem to think is that old age is synonymous with Alzheimer's and dementia. It's not. It's extraordinarily rare, actually. Um, Alzheimer's affects, I believe, or dementia as a whole, affects 55 million people globally. Yeah. So that's 0.007% of the population. Now, when you think about that number, it's not really very big in terms of the... Uh, in based on the 7.5 billion people that we have, right? Um, but we seem to have this cultural sort of belief that it's a very common part of aging. Right. Yet it seems prevalent enough that even in the UK in 2018, that home 
like care homes are putting out policies to deal with transgender patients who are waking up um, and they're getting more and more now proportionally and this is why we need researchers because i'm not a researcher right i'm not um i it, it falls down to the expertise of detransitioners to explain our position right right, and right. A, a lot of onus gets put on us but you know we are where we are um so back on the dementia thing you've got places like Wales and stuff bringing out these policies to deal with the entourage of of all these uh trans elderly patients and early onset dementia now you may think oh that's just a measure of inclusion they're just trying to be what whatever it's not it's you're literally dealing with 0.3 percent of the population so if we take 0.3 percent of that 55 million across the world it's about it's about 150,000 trans people but it's enough again that's sorry i know i'm just spitting numbers no, at you it's because the 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 thing is that's off the premise that every single trans person got dementia but if you think it's zero zero point seven percent of the population get alzheimer's then it should be even smaller in the trans po population but it's not and this gets mentioned in texts by julia serrano in a 2007 uh women girl about um people getting trans people getting early onset dementia in the 50s and 60s so this led wow. us down this huge rabbit hole now i know you're probably trying to dip in but i need a i need a try i'll try my best to jump to the point um but remember when i said there was that guy who told us about um how he was feeling and it gave us that permission to be like actually that's kind of how i feel he is about a decade older than me and he was living with a trans woman um who was only in her early 50s and began getting really bad uh alzheimer's and eventually she's she's now in a home i don't even know if she's still alive or not but it got very rapid very quickly so that was one of the things that i didn't again i didn't know about and i started looking into it and i found some troubling things so of those dementia patients um women are outnumber men two to one and the reason is um because of a drop of estrogen in the middle age following menopause wow so in women this is because the estrogen helps with a uh, normal brain function too and i'm gonna get I'll, I'll get into the rest of it but um studies have found that if you give a woman say estrogen replacement therapy in middle age they have a significantly lower risk of alzheimer's but if they have it after a certain age that risk goes up mm. in men in men high estrogen is the reason predominantly for um for dementia right so when you bring this back uh to the trans community you've got trans females who have got no estrogen in the system only testosterone right mm -hmm. and you've got trans and i'm sorry i'm using the the inverse language here but a no, male this is a scientifically on... accurate description males yeah. and females we're yeah. going with that right now so a trans male on estrogen is also at an elevated risk so we are essentially sleepwalking into a disaster wow. now one of the main hormones as well hormone replacement therapy also impacts the stress hormone called i think it's cortisol um and that's the the one that stimulates sort of your um your adrenal response you you know it's the one that wakes you up um but too much too high levels of cortisol and stress can influence dementia too wow. which has been linked to depression Depression and an effect here where you've got not just males but females who are both at massive risk and the problem is Blair is they will say that's that's a lot of bollocks we found that estrogen helps women therefore trans women will be okay which is right? which is purely an ideological position that's ideological that's not but, science yes yes but the, do you see the problem here yes. so they're the backup of their science is based on the science that's used for females for instance right. hormone replacement therapy in middle-aged women does have uh, about a 30 40 percent reduction in alzheimer's but that's women that's females and what a lot of people don't understand and male and females themselves have got a very different immune system and endocrine system 
and they react very differently to uh, estrogen and testosterone. It's just how we're made. I don't blame me if you cut that ramble because that was no, a lot no. of like... No, no, you actually froze for a second. So if I was looking just like stuck with an expression, it's because you froze for a second. But I think I, I think I got the gist of what you're saying. It's like, you know, that is an ideological thing to say, well, if it's good for trans women, then it's good for women. And you completely take out the biological sex of a person. And this is just one of many <laughs> ways in which the medical community is failing both trans and detrans people, in my opinion. I mean... It's, it's, yes. I, I've told this story about how, you know, when I went in to get my HRG prescription, I walked out 15 minutes later with it and I was never told a single side effect. I was never told a single potential complication. I was never told the ways in which this may negatively impact my life. It was completely sold up by the doctor. And the doctor wasn't even like a trans activist sort of doctor you know he was an endocrinologist for actually elderly women that was his main clientele and i lived in a small town where i was like one of the only trans people so he had maybe one or two other trans patients and yet even he was so maybe even just like subconsciously persuaded by activists and saying certain things and parroting these talking points he told me when you're on estrogen you'll feel the best you've ever felt because that's the narrative meanwhile you know as someone who's been on for seven years now i think i've been on long enough to know the positive and negatives for which there's many positives I enjoy. It's changed my body in ways that I prefer, obviously. But, you know, when it comes to certain things, like I have no libido, I have no sex drive, I have like no desire to have sex. And as a bit of a misconception, people assume that because I post like bikini pictures and stuff like that, that I'm sexual. I'm really a non-sexual human being. Um, and, yeah. you know, people don't talk about that. People don't talk about have a severe lack of energy. I have a brain fog a lot of the times. And I think that's from the estradiol that I take. Um, it is, but I I, I want to get into, and the fact that we have. Do you know why you feel so tired all the time? That's because why? the the estrogen also increases melanin, uh, or melatonin, sorry, um, which uh, regulates your drowsiness, your sleep, helps you fall off to sleep, and all sorts of stuff. Right. So it makes sense for a lot of trans women to be fatigued because they'll have yeah. slightly higher elevated levels and also they've got higher stress levels because of the hormone mm -hmm. um and yeah the the lack of testosterone plays a vital part into your libido so a healthy one um this is and why... somebody was had sorry sorry i'm sorry this is why I was going to say, this is why, um, you know, this is pretty controversial to say in the trans community, it won't really sound controversial outside of it, but I cycle off of my hormones every once in a while because I don't think it's necessarily healthy for me to have a constant state of no testosterone and high estrogen. You know, it's, and, and there are negative aspects of, of going back and forth too. And I'm not advocating that because that can be very bad for people as well. However, I've noticed that my body and my mental health and everything kind of operates at its finest when once every three months I'll go off for a week. And suddenly I have a sex drive back and suddenly I have all this energy to be like this unstoppable force and work really hard. And then, yeah. you know, if I'm ever slacking on my content, I might just be too thick in this estrogen brain fog. You know what I mean? I'm not kidding. These are these are problems with these medications. Um, but more information is, is, is the only answer, right? Like people have to know these are the things yeah. that are going to happen when you take them. But when you hide it, you can't. I really want to get into um, and it sucks that we have to retell this and we have to whatever but like the specifically the complications you've had with bottom surgery because mm -hmm. there's also a huge incentive to keep this information from people um as someone who's had many trans friends who have gotten the bottom surgery throughout the years even they when i have a close relationship with them there's a gatekeeping that occurs when i go there and ask that question um so what were your complications with your bottom surgery Richie? so uh firstly i during surgery i experienced severe hemorrhaging um i lost an a, 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 a stupendous amount of blood and i think that has contributed to a lot of the after things that came with it um i don't know maybe they were just battling to stop it or whatever but i also have a constricted urethra and um, what that basically means is after surgery the urethra was, if you imagine a straw being bent, um, it was essentially like that. So I just couldn't pee and it was the worst agony I've ever felt in my life. I uh, had to get revision for that. And I'm actually due to get another urethral dilation, which is something I have to get every two to four years, maybe four or five. 
um, and that basically just inflates the urethra, but you have to do that under general anesthetic. Um, so what that basically means is I, and this is another thing that people don't talk about, is the hormones, whether or not you've had surgery or not, can impact your waterworks quite a lot, like pain and stuff. Yes. Um, it's worse so for females than testosterone. But when you have surgery, like add me urethra shortens, not just in the surgery, but in the two revisions that I had, right? So I don't have much of a warning. And also I can't ever really empty my bladder. So even after a pee, and no matter how long I stay there and wipe and whatever I do, ages after it will just seep out um, the pee. So essentially I get like wet pants and, you know, you, you I'm in my 30s, I don't want to be smelling a piss. It's it's really embarrassing. Um, and that was something I just did not anticipate whatsoever. Um, the other thing was, uh, and this is quite common, at all sutras, um, which are the sort of the lines that hold the stitching together um, just outside the vaginal canal. Um, both of them popped open on either side and uh, it's left a kind of a dent in the skin. It's not nice to look at. Don't like the aesthetics of it at all. It's horrible for me. And um, you've got the pain, the pain with walking, the pain with sitting. Um, I also struggling a lot with me weight. Again, I used to have a really bad eating disorder before I transitioned and then that was totally under control. And now post surgery, it's like, I can't, no matter how happy I am, I just can't keep the weight off, you know? And when I do do exercise, it just hurts so goddamn much after a while. So, and I'm worried, like sometimes I'm worried that if I was to do weights or something that I feel like, it, it feels like it's almost even four years down the line, it feels like it's it's not secure or whatever. And I know prolapse is extremely rare, but it, it can happen. But anyway, back to my issues. Um, sex is extremely difficult because one don't have much sensation i can't climax but that comes from the prostate sensation um uh but the the vaginal passage itself is really narrow um i struggle getting even a small dilator in and that's not from the lack of dilation i was i was very very um and after i went through it even though i felt tremendous for grouse like this is me body now i need to need to maintain it uh keeping it clean so i dish every week which is uh something or oh, something that you have to do and some people don't do that but you have to do that um and i had a umpteen amount of infections um after which is common granulation tissue and realistically it's like say you were saying about the the estrogen and how it kills your sex drive now this now i can't even like if i'm getting with someone right or if I, even if i wanted to if if i had that then i've got to like do all this mad sort of preparation and it it, it just it kills the moment and it's like dating just doesn't doesn't exist for me it's it's if I go on testosterone and get libido back with this, I'll end up killing myself. That's how I feel. <sighs> that was a lot. Mm. Um, why do you say that it would... Okay, so I know that a lot of the times with people that are detransitioning, there is this pressure to like go back on the hormone associated yeah. with your birth sex like to go back on testosterone obviously you know you tried to live as a trans woman you realize it was not for you now you would obviously love to just be able to snap your fingers and live like yeah. a regular boy how do you feel about going back on testosterone well here's the thing so medical detransition is only really possible for one category of people and that's the ones who didn't take any hormones after puberty completed so tana stage four or five, whatever the hell it is, which is normally like the very early 20s. Um, anyone who sort of started after early 20s and was on hormones for even five, six, seven years 
they stop, their body will kick in. And like, just like as you do when you, every three months, you're going out to come back online yeah. and people don't realize yet that you're going out to play a big part to your immune system too and your endocrine system. A lot, like a lot goes on down there, right? Um, and not, not having them um, massively, massively hinders you. So for me to go back on testosterone, I think from what I've looked at in terms of the research, seems like that is going to be the healthy way forward. But there is some hell that comes with that. For instance, the scroll graph that was used inside, even though there was laser hair removal like that happened prior, sorry, at electrolysis prior um, to the surgery, there, there is still a chance that you'll get hair grown back, but internally, depending on which way they flip the skin as well, mm. um, you can't let it close up because, again, that can get internal growth of internal hairs, which can cause serious infections and sepsis. Uh, you can get all sorts of horrendous issues with that. Um, however, it seems that all the guys in the group who are in similar situations to me, some who are going to size, which means they don't have balls, um, well, they do just metaphorical ones, just not um, physical ones. Um, they find that their mental health is just drastically way better. They've got so much energy and it's great. But one of the other things that terrifies me is some of them are reporting changes in the attraction and sexuality. Now, I've just spent three decades getting my head around mine after all this. And it's like, why should I go through that again I, I, the risk that say that turned us straight because i i would call myself gay right even though i'm essentially a eunuch um and a sexist one if that and uh i feel like sorry i've just totally lost my point there Blair. uh totally just wondering. the the drawback with going back on t but we can we can go on to the next question if you want no um, no it's fine okay. um Oh, yeah. The one important point about that, I think it boils down to this belief that estrogen is the essence of woman and testosterone is the essence of man. Uh, it's not true. It's it's like every car needs oil in the engine as much as a gas to run. Right. Mm -hmm. You need both. You need a well oiled engine. Otherwise, the engine will break down. But you need the gas to burn to make the car go. Right. You need both. It's the same if testosterone and estrogen now the thing is as well and i didn't know this is when you go on testosterone roughly about 20 percent of the testosterone that you take will be converted in a process called um aromatization um about 20 percent gets converted in estrogen naturally and that happens in the body fat um so people like me who take testosterone the weight loss just happens whereas now i'm, I'm returning to when i rounded chubby chunky figure at the minute and uh that's that's another motivation to go on um but again let's say i go on testosterone and i feel great and now i've got this libido right and now i've got the sex drive and let's just say sexuality aside whatever i've got this and i can't do anything with it and when i try to it just what would you do what what like to me that seems like an unfair ask to mm -hmm. and it and, and it goes down to this belief that and i don't believe that anyone can transition from male to female and back to male there is no there was i never went to female and i'm not going back to male now i was male from the start i took estrogen mm -hmm. and had surgery that's what happened and that's all most people really want to accept no one's saying don't transition, don't live uh, or dress how you please. It's just accept for your own health reasons what your body needs and what you are. Mm -hmm. And sex matters. Sex is so important to everything. Um, like, and I'm not talking about the act, I'm talking about the, the physicalities, the, the chemistry behind it, you know? Um, it's and, and it gets understated to the point where it's bigotry to to bring any of these things up. I th I think that the simple fact that you and other people who have gone through what you've gone through are forced to sort of live in this no man's land in terms of health and in terms of uh, medicine now 
to where there really is no correct answer for you now because as you just explained there are so many drawbacks to going back on testosterone which is you know the male sex hormone and now that you want to live as male that obviously is a no-brainer you'd want that the fact that you guys are put in this like gray area where there's no doctors that can give you a good answer and there's no one that can truly help you shows the seriousness the permanence and the irreversibility of transitioning right there that's the proof the fact that if you regret it you're going to be in this no man's land and the fact that people don't see that and still treat it as if it is reversible or as if it isn't a big deal really blows my mind and the fact that we're telling trans people even trans people who are trans and make that choice and end up happy and live great and hopefully amazing lives that's what we all want right even for those people to have this lack of information about their own drugs that they're taking and their own experience and their own mm. options helps no one and hurts everyone um i really want to get into you talked about how there were sort of this there was this myriad of like you know issues that you had aside from gender dysphoria um that were overlooked when it came to people sort of rushing you into getting these surgeries that you now regret um what was that about so um i had a diagnosed um, or suspected diagnosis, or however they want to label it, of obsessive compulsive disorder. Very severe. And I mean, if you want to see that play out, just look at me do trans advocacy. I've been obsessed about it and I've just went all in. And then to me, it's like probably the healthiest obsession I've ever had, right? Um, but when you're in an obsessive state, it's your life, it's everything, um, it's, it's the ultimate reason for whatever and i went to therapy believe him because i'd experienced high anxiety throughout my life and um, i've got my own sort of everyone has got their own issues that and or your own troubles but in my early 20s i just thought i can't go on like this i'm gonna i'm not gonna last very long if my mental health is this bad i was just exhausted and tired from it all and um, and i'd came up with this radical theory from or uh, basically from what I found online that um, I was this victim of some uh, unremembered abuse or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I became obsessed with this idea that that, that that explained why I was all OCD, why I had all this anxiety, why I was so depressed, why I hated my body, uh, all this sort of thing. And um, I went to a therapist about it and the psychologist was great. He was just like, a few a few months and he was like by the way um you've got really bad ocd um and then he gave us all this information on like the there was a big huge thing about false memory syndrome in the 90s i think or 2000s it was when we were kids or when i was a kid sorry i've just made you older how old are you again blair i just sorry. turned 29 oh bless you 30 soon and you're 30, 35 right I'm 35. And you have 35. such a young energy and you look so young. I I, I I, feel like you're younger than me, but but you're not. <laughs> Castrate life. What can I say? Uh, um, I don't want, I don't know if I should laugh or not laugh. I don't, <laughs> it's okay. You can laugh. All right, guys. So we've all been there when we've been searching on the internet and we don't necessarily want our search history to show up on our browser. Maybe you're stalking an ex and you don't quite want your current relationship to see you've been doing that. And I know what you're going to say, incognito mode is enough, right? No, it's not. You're completely wrong. Even in incognito mode, your ISP can still get your data and sell it. ExpressVPN is an app that actually reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers and does not let your ISP get any of your information. I make sure ExpressVPN is on every single time I'm using the internet. It's always in the background and I never even notice. I forget that it's running. It's that easy. It's available on all your devices. That's your phone, your computer, your tablets, all of it. To so protect your online information today with the VPN rated number one, numero uno, by Business Insider by visiting my link, expressvpn.com slash Blair. And with that link, you can get an extra three months free off of a year package. So it's an amazing deal. That is expressvpn.com slash Blair, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Blair and have fun. Okay. Um, I can't remember where I was at. Um, it was about just... all the issues that you had that were overlooked along the process. Yeah, so um, the psychologist was very much like, you've got really bad OCD. We're not going to explore this any further because it'll just feel it. And he basically kind of 
delivered a challenge to this rumination that had ruled us for quite a few, about three or four years at that point. Mm. And at that moment, around that time, and it was just bad luck in my opinion, I saw a gay guy I knew who transitioned. And I was like, oh God, that's interesting. And I didn't realize that was a possibility. So I went online and Googled transition gender dysphoria, found these trans forums. And I basically said, I think I'm trans. Here's me sort of a uh, life story. Here's me symptoms. And then I had a new obsession. And I went back to the psychologist as this was happening. And I was like, forget all that. Forget everything I told you. It's nothing to do with that. It's all because I'm trans. In fact, I'm 99% sure I'm trans. And uh, and then I went back the next week and said, forget last week, I'm 100% sure I'm trans. Like, and he was like, I've just literally talked about all CD, but okay, off you go. Um, and he kind of noted it down that was like really obsessive and all this information got shared with the gender clinic later on. Um, I had severe depression, anxiety, um, addiction issues. I'd, there was a lot going on. And uh, when I went into the gender clinic in 24, well, 2015 is when I probably got enrolled, but I got referred in 2013. Um, the OCD kind of just got tra as you're a trans person with OCD, and that's it. Yeah. You are trans. If I could just jump in right? very quickly, and I don't want you to forget what you're saying, but um, that's so true. Like, I. I remember when I was very early in my transition, I would go to these support groups. Um, I only went to three or four be like in a row because I realized they were really culty and really weird. But, um, you know, th they would talk, all these people I could see around me had issues, right? Like all these other young trans people and young non-binary and, and all the identities people around me. It's like, they clearly were all going through so much and transition and the identification as trans was sort of discussed as the cure to all these things. So they'd be talking about their depression, about their anxiety, about abuse at home, about um, being rape survivors. And transition was treated as this, this golden blanket that would cover all of it and make it all look pretty. And you would never have to look at it again because it all just has to do with the fact that you're trans. And yeah. that to me is so toxic. Yeah, it is. Um, and it goes down into the narratives of who is truly trans and who isn't. And in my mind, I just look at, I don't look at fake or real or true or, or true scumming like that. I just look at people who transition and people who don't. Yeah. If you've transitioned, um, your opinion is more valuable to me than somebody who wants to speak about transition, who thinks the trans, who hasn't. Right. Right. It's just like and that's that's t tends to be the people who speak the loudest, the people who haven't transitioned, but consider themselves trans. Yeah. These are the people who are speaking on behalf of everyone else and all. And when I say like the the majority, I, I really do mean that there is an unspoken majority of transitioners who literally do live their lives in peace. Uh, they do their own thing. Right. No hyperbole. And uh, they get lumped in with all these people who make these insane demands, you know, mm -hmm. um, and some of it is insane. But sorry, I forgot the previous point that we're on. You'll have to keep us on track. Yeah, it's still I'm just loving this conversation. I don't even mind if it veers off, but it was about the issues that were overlooked. In your transition. Ah, the issues that were overlooked before. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I had all I had a lot of complex comorbidities and suspected uh, autism, ADHD. Um, I've been waiting for like a diagnosis for ages. But anyway, um, I had a lot of doubt when I went in the gender clinic and I was like, I refused surgery, like from the moment I went in, because that's the first question that asked us when I, when I saw the psychiatrist there, I was like, do you want general surgery? I was like, oh, fuck it, I don't think so. Um, can I have some therapy to think about it sort of thing? And, um, two years of them asking back and forward, eventually I said yes. Uh, again, there was a lot of other issues going on and I'm skipping over like a journey that was like three or four years and a lot happened and a lot happened that I can't talk about because I've got an active court case going on, but there were factors in there that I haven't been totally public about that have given it, and even the things that I've been public about have given it significant weight as well but um 
essentially can we just hone in really quickly on the fact that you refused bottom surgery and you were mm -hmm. repeatedly asked if you're going to get it in my mind yeah. if someone refuses a surgery says no to a surgery i'm not quite sure why they would be asked multiple times again if they're going to get it so here's the problem we'll have like the gender services in the uk don't consider themselves a mental health service they consider themselves a medical service mm. which basically means they're not there to treat men mentally ill people they're there to treat people with a medical condition right. and they're there to give a service and one of their services is surgery that is how they view it and it's like are you ready for it or not you can always come back later but bear in mind there's a five-year wait time at the minute and it's you know i was also getting therapy and i'm skipping over a lot because there, there's just so much to to go into and i know somebody listening into this or watching this bag will be thinking well you said yes at the end of the day and i'm like yeah i understand that part of my responsibility i do and obviously i regret saying yes eventually but it still doesn't change the fact that there were so many not not just amber but blaring red flags prior to me walking into the hospital that should have stopped me from even going there in the first place um and and i'm sorry and just the fact that you know we have we have to talk about and i hate to jump around but like i just want to fit everything in this conversation we have to talk mm. about the fact that complication with these surgeries is so much more common than people think um i really don't know anyone who has been honest about the surgery with me that has not talked about at least one complication um and i think yours is unfortunately on a little bit more of the extreme side of complications but there's always something right and there is it's this it's not though blair it really isn't it is far worse than me no you've got people who... oh my gosh yeah it gets way worse you you get you, you know you get people who have got um cavities that develop between the vaginal entrance and the bowel oh my God. um you get prolapse you get constant infection you get necrosis which is the death of skin which is you know dead skin uh dead cells um and it gets way worse for females who have who have any sort of bottom surgery because the body can the body can cope way better with taking stuff away than adding to mm. um and the whole the whole deal with phalloplasties that is nightmare fuel that is absolutely crazy mm. um which is why i'm i'm quite interested in advocating for a long term look into the um complications and the success rate of the surgery uh sensation rate um because so many people lose sensation uh which when you understand body trauma makes sense because if you um for instance if you lost an arm or a leg in a tragic accident your body has a way of kind of numbing the the cells around the damaged site to stop pain it's like a mechanism and when this is why a lot of women who have mastectomies um have no sensation in the chest and a lot of people mm. have bottom surgery have got no sensation there uh a lot and because i lost a lot of blood too that probably didn't help my own sensation because mm. my body probably reacted as it should do to this major trauma you know your pelvis is getting drilled in you right you know um and veins are getting cut up and it, it's brutal like I, even though I've had the surgery, I still can't properly watch the video of like them doing it to anyone. It's just right. unwatchable. It's crazy. Right. Um, um, so it's just so crazy because like, even when I think I'm knowledgeable about something like a second ago when I'm like, and you're on the more extreme end, it's just not the case. And you know what? There is such a problem with the fact that I am a trans person who has been transitioning for seven years, who's very much involved in trans discourse, who has made a career off talking about these things that I'm still consistently learning every time I talk to you and, and with someone else in this space. It's like, how on earth does anyone think kids are making informed decisions to go through with this? If I'm still learning about it as someone who is happy with my transition and, and you've gone through what you've gone through, 
you know, I know that the U.S. is actually way worse than the U.K. now in terms of kids transitioning when it used to be the opposite, I think. Um, how do you feel when you see the insanity here going on that you have Joe Biden advocating for, you know, transition surgeries for minors, Rachel Levine and all of the corporate press? There's not even any of them that don't accept Fox News. I mean, the fact that they're just being so brazen about it tells you everything. And I think people are watching with existential horror. And people like in from across the ocean, you know, where we look at Biden, we just think this guy looks like he belongs in a retirement home, you know. Speaking of dementia, right? He, he looks like he, yeah, he maybe barely, he's a he looks woman. confused. <laughs> <laughs> too much, too high estrogen, Biden. That's that's what it is. Right. Um, but but yeah, it must it, feel I, terrifying to see it, to know what you've gone through, and to see these kids going down the same path. But it it kind of makes sense when you understand how the the market works in the yeah. like the medical market works in the US. There's a much bigger incentive to drive it on their end, yeah. Um, especially with the money that's involved. Like you know, you guys are crazy with the the healthcare shit. I mean, it's totally out of control how much you guys have to pay for for even basic things. And I know insurers will cover the bill or some of the bill but i've read some ridiculous reports you know like people having 10 minute conversations and paying a thousand dollars and shit like that and it's like uh it, it it feels totally out of control but i fear i fear what i feel is going to happen in the us is you, you've already got state by state who are looking at this issue <laughs> and some some are taking it to nth degrees and some are taking a more sort of conservative look and i don't mean conservative republican i mean conservative in the sense of take a step back be methodical about it and what i believe what will happen is um when you get to about the fourth or fifth state that bans child transition or whatever uh like you've kind of close to got in florida you've got you're close to getting that in tennessee i don't know if that's even is that a state blair or is that yes an area yes yes that's a state. i know Thank tennessee is God. going Ted, uh, uh, tennessee is going hard against this shit right now too yeah yeah um as soon as you get the fourth or fifth one the rest will fall in line very quickly that's how I, that'll how it'll happen and it'll happen extraordinarily fast I um hope so. It, it's it's coming the uk has fortunately um with the help of other european uh countries like finland sweden have made some and in the netherlands as well have made some very important changes um and we are taking a critical look at it thankfully after after all this time but what i fear is that it'll be a, a lot like how in the 40s and 50s, there were like 10,000s and thousands of lobotomies performed. Mm -hmm. And those people, it was a massive outrage, like this was. And then in the 50s and 60s, there was no mention of them ever again. And I feel like mm. this is probably where we're going to end up with the transitioners and anyone else who gets harmed. They're just going to be the hot button issue until it gets resolved. And then they'll be forgotten about, which is something that I'm keen to make sure that doesn't happen because there is a potential that, imagine this, in 10, 15 years' time, we've got increased rates of early onset dementia amongst the, the population. Trans men are the most at risk to this, by the way, um, because of the lack of estrogen in the in the body and the impact of testosterone. Uh, they're, they're at a huger risk for the autoimmune stuff, multiple cirrhosis, the bone marrow, um, kids, females who are put on puberty bloggers have got brittle bones in adulthood um males get that too but not to the degree it, it just seems far more devastating on the female body than it does to the male body mm. and i'm not here to dissuade anyone from taking it i'm here to say to give information we need i'm not a researcher and we need people who are researchers who are not detrans who are not trans who have got no stake into this need to have uh, some sort of joint international effort looking at the data long term because I believe it's there. It's like the stuff with um with with like the uh the Alzheimer's, you know, it's it's kind of there. It's just not labeled the way you would want it to be, you know yeah. what I mean? 
Um, and there is a lot of vested interest in no one wants to be the bad guy here. You know, no one wants to say something that is they've been told is doing harm. Um, especially when you're a high powered medical professional and you're dealing with the general health of all the other health issues that we we'll have to deal with in the world. And somebody comes along and says, what about trans people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you get back to me thinking, but yeah, sure. That mm -hmm. sounds good. They don't have the time. They don't have the time to sit and do it. And also um, there's an incentive on behalf of doctors who do operate on people who end up having these regrets, such as yourself, to not acknowledge it because that's an X on their record. You know, why Why yeah. would a, a surgeon ever want to acknowledge that someone had issues with their work or, or even worse, like really, really hated going with them? If you went to the dentist, Blair, and you had a horrible time and let's say the, you know, they didn't do the pain management properly and it was ultimately traumatic, would you go back of course. to that dentist? Yeah. Right. You know, that's kind of where we are with this too. Like, I don't want to go back to the gender clinic when I feel like they've let me down completely. Um, there's there aren't surgeries that can reverse this. There's not like phalloplasty. Don't make me fucking laugh. There's just nothing Ugh. really that I can uh, do. Um, there is something you can do to get it closed up, and but you have problems with the urethral bit. It's it's savage. This is it. Uh, I was in an obsessive as fuck state and uh, very obsessive. And when I kind of came out of that obsession, um, unfortunately, it took surgery to kind of do it. It was um, that's when I realized how much I fucked up. But even before surgery, I was kind of naturally trying to pull back uh, and detransition. But all that got put down to internalized transphobia and internalized cis sexism, which is. Uh, a weird phrase you know it's almost poetic uh the lies that they come up with you know was was there a moment when you realized that you were going to detransition like like what did it feel like when you finally came to the conclusion that it's like hard to even say because it's so hard but that this was not the right decision that there were mistakes was made like, you were let down what happened it was like uh, when I realized, well, first of all, the regret ruled us for the first few months. And I was like, I was beside myself and I didn't know what I was going to do. And then I very much had this whole sort of, well, I've made this bed. I need to lie in it. And I just focused all my energy into work. And that's the only thing I did. I just did lots and lots and lots of work and um, focused very hard on that. And uh, when I kind of came out of that, because it only lasts so long when you try to distract yourself, whatever it is, um, I I was just it it was just this feeling of sort of surrender, you know. It was like I'm giving up fighting myself. I'm giving up hating myself. I'm giving up the whole shebang. I, I just felt like I was surrendering this idea that I was trans it was just like I'm just gonna let it go and see what happens and when I did I just felt like myself um but that this and again going back to when I first when, when we first start the conversation when I say this is almost this expectation but yeah what about all the happy trans people right and it's like do any of them say well what about the unhappy trans people that don't fucking do it so right and if you need to see some happy trans people you can go on a uh, disney channel now you can watch <laughs> a white house press conference you can turn on cnn you can open yahoo.com you can open people magazine pretty sure we have enough representation of everything trans is magical and this is a, an amazing experience and everything's perfect pretty sure it's time for a little bit of fucking nuance so anyone who has that to say at all, I don't get that. What you're advocating for is that it is an entirely slanted point of view on an issue with so much gray area your head can spin. But but then you realize that most people, I think sometimes when you are someone who is capable of understanding nuance and gray areas and consequences and all of this, you have a hard time, like you underestimate how other people actually can't process those gray areas, can't process pitfalls of their ideology. I think their brains are literally incapable of it. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll tell ourselves a story no matter what we're doing, right. don't we? So they tell themselves a story, and if you have it as easy as 
these people equals bad if they believe that that everything else is just falls into place you know yeah um it's and it's amazing turning into this apparent genocidal whatever fascist right-wing conspiracy theory, whatever they want to call us these days um and i'm just like well let's take a step back for a second and understand what i had before detransitioned i blended in i was like you know there are there are there is that top percentage of people who pass seamlessly in the world you know um i wasn't in that top percentage by any means but i wasn't like clockable right you know what i mean i was blended in i was very i looked very bread and butter if not a little bit large because i'm like five nine and i do have quite wide shoulders but i i just blended in uh work was going fine um you know life was grinding on and i had everything and i had no there was no benefit for me to do this you know i've got a job um there is no money in in day trans advocacy there's no money there's there's more money in trans advocacy than day trans advocacy if i wasn't for right. the money Say. i would pull a kettles and uh get fake swatted and get somebody to uh pretend that i had a gun at my face when i didn't and raise a hundred thousand dollars and move to ireland you know that's what i would do but you know i'm not kettles so i'm not going to do that i've got integrity but no slant um Dory, if you need to cut that i understand no. how it works <laughs> no we're not going to cut anything um cool. it's 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 amazing to me also and actually quite hilarious how you guys will get branded as right wing far right conservative whatever and it's like is that the case or is it the case that only right wing outlets are actually willing to platform you guys because i haven't yeah. seen anyone on the left at all not one publication jumping to help you guys or tell you guys a story in fact it's the opposite you'll often get smeared what was it that one of them said about um chloe the detransitioner um did some horrible hit piece on her and she's like oh a, yes a teenage girl <laughs> who went through something traumatic and it's like these people are disgusting yeah um they they really really went out on the stocks for her and it was just like you know and it was done by a trans activist oh i'm sure less. i'm sure no like or a trans woman and it was just no doubt. it was just pure vile hatred and it was a really bad look but you know they when they do these things they are they are doing our pr for free right mm -hmm. you know and it's just like crack on do a hit piece if you like you're just gonna look like a twat right i mean um I'm sat here, Chloe sat here, and we've got these issues, we've had this experience, we're real, we're, we're not going away. You can say whatever shit you like that makes you sleep at night, but we're not going away, you know? We're here to help people who are impacted by this, not just day transitioners, transitioners too. Like, we deserve to know what this is doing to us. We deserve research, we deserve to... You know, we deserve better than a, a survey you fill in that asks how happy you are. You know, we mm -hmm. deserve real research, independent researchers. And research that um, isn't ran by activists, because the biggest problem with the lack of information about these issues, um, regardless of where you're coming from ideologically, there is a lack of information, is that it's activists running the show. It's activists pressuring the doctors. It's activists enacting laws, you know, to like prosecute people for conversion therapy if they're healthily pushing back on a client in therapy who is feeling gender issues, you know. It's it's completely ran by crazy people. And that's the main problem. So until other people with without a stake in the game, as you mentioned earlier, are willing to actually put their hat in the ring and say, actually, here's a cultivation of information that's accurate, it's going to continue to be this like disgusting cycle. Yeah, and again, it, it it's not because they're hatching an evil plan, and it, it, it's because they literally believe that this is a root way to their rights and their ex existential existence right. is being threatened. Because the whole movement relies on cat catastrophization. The whole thing relies on it, right? So it's this whole idea that if you don't transition a kid, they'll die. They'll kill themselves. And it was like, so are we you know are we doing all these measures to protect 
trans people from themselves because that's what it sounds like it doesn't you know what i mean it's like the the whole sort of suicide baiting um the obsession with death dead mm. names like dead name is such a strange concept because if you detransition what does that make your trans name undead name you know and why know. and why does that part of me have to be dead i've always found that really strange as well there's this expectation yeah. and there's this narrative of how you're supposed to live when you're a trans person and i'm supposed to look at my past and like my childhood as a boy and my teenagehood as a boy and be like that person's dead that's not me no that was always me it's still me i'm just a different version of me and this whole idea of throwing an identity away has always been very strange yeah. to me as well it is it is very i found it very troubling it's very disconnecting and a lot of yeah. people have trauma that they want a free pass to get away with and when you've got a lot of whatever it is say you've got a really bad parental connection and say yeah you had um horrific abuse growing up and this is a free pass out of that it's a free you know you don't have to like intellectualize or justify it just say i'm trans and everything else falls into place but it's a delay on those issues for a lot of us and a lot of <coughs> us find um and the science is really interested in about the average time of day transitioners so women um spend about five years to six years on average before they detransition mm. whereas men spend eight years oh, wow. eight and nine years so this is one of the reasons why the a lot of the female detransitioners really start speaking up in 2019 2020 oh my and God, it's one right? of the reasons why the male detransitioners are coming out now because it all goes back to the 2014 boom which is when i came out too yay that is um, so amazing that you put that together because I do remember in 2019, 2020, you know, as someone who's wanted to highlight these stories, I would have a hard time even finding um, male detransitioners to talk to because they just weren't as prevalent. Um, yeah. So that's crazy that now it's like, yeah, two year, two, three years later, here we go. Right on time, bang on time. Wow. Um, and the, the numbers, uh, again, this is hard to count. So, I'm trying to remember what the name of the survey was. It was like, it's a UCSL or do you know what I'm talking about? It's a very big organization in the US that does these transgender surveys. Oh, right? UCLA. That's the that's the one. And uh, Alex, who uh, runs the D-Trans um, Reddit, uh, they've got a Twitter presence, very, very informative individual. They know a lot of stuff. Um, they 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 did a breakdown of the survey and found that if you're a detransitioner, you get filtered out on like the second question. Because to fill in the survey, you need to identify as trans. But if you do trans, why the hell are you gonna fill out the survey and call yourself trans? Oh, right. So right. it's like, do you know like like say in a form that has branching options, you know, like if you answer this one, it ends the form. But if you answer this one, it goes on to the next one. Yeah. So what the way they count day transitioners is really odd to the point where it's not going to show up in the data at all because they're not allowed to count themselves in and this is kind of where we're at because we're playing a language game it's all language and it's that's all they have that's all that the left uses language yeah. to control in all areas this is definitely one of them you know if they if they can exclude an entire population from the survey just based on wording that to me i know you said that you can't necessarily attribute like evil intentions but like sometimes sometimes that kind of stuff is evil this this incentive to like push you guys under the shadows and i've seen the vitriol you guys get because i get a lot of it too because obviously i talk to you guys which is this mortal set in the trans community even though i don't really care um you know like the level of hatred thrown at you guys is something that is i mean i, I relate to but that's also like very unique I like it because, not that I like hate, not that I'm a sadomasochist or anything like that, right? I like it because it proves that we're doing something right. 100%. It proves that, it proves that there's something that we're saying that is really getting them. Because if it was that outlandish and that crazy and that unbelievable and unreal, you could just say that and ignore it and move on with your life. Yes. But what I'm saying has traction because it has truth in it. Because all I did, all I did from the get-go, I was like, I'm just going to be honest and tell people how I feel and what happened. That's it. That's my bread and butter. And that's all I've done. 
and uh you know people can call us whatever but that's the truth you just have to deal with it you know um and here we are it's kind of and like the I've... flat earth movement right it's like not that you guys are like the flat earth movement but like the way in which these things are treated in the sense of like no one has this level of hatred for the flat earth movement because what they're saying is crazy and everyone just kind of is yeah. like yeah that's crazy but the reason you guys are getting all the slings and arrows you are is because you're making waves a you're speaking truth b and you're honestly doing a very good job at it i have to say i don't know how organized all of you guys and when i say you guys i mean like chloe shapeshifter um helena like all the sort of people that have gotten followings within that world you guys do have a very unified message and you guys have also in my opinion despite being called hateful you guys have done a very good job of making sure that your message doesn't like go overboard to the point of like everything trans is a scam and trans people are always going to detransition because then you obviously that's not like the great areas true. we're talking about um so i think you guys are doing amazing yeah bless it i think you know there is first of all in terms of is there a collective sort of a consensus i don't think so i think there is a a, a camaraderie in people who have been harmed like that survivor sort of bonding yeah. right like um and i think that it, it it just changes your perspective you know in in a way that only other people who have lost out whatever that is can relate to um and a lot of people you know i'll get the transition of saying oh god you know my story is nothing compared to yours so and i'm like don't play that game mm -hmm. don't play that game with you because that is a reason for you as an individual not to allow yourself any empathy or sympathy for yourself mm. because you have this idea that somebody has it worth therefore you're not worth right. the pain but i say these people your pain is your pain right trans day trans no one is going to live your pain but you no one's going to live your joy but you it's it you know that's that's the uh the key takeaway there sorry yeah. i know we've probably got a lot more to to cover here so yeah i i just uh, how do you sort of like has it been emotionally taxing the level of hatred that you got that you get specifically because i mean as much as like i've been a public figure on the internet for years now and so i feel like if anyone has like a harsh skin i get attacked so, so much i have a very you know thick skin um but it's a it's it's kind of a lie on my part to say that it never ever affects me because it definitely has um has it affected you sometimes um you know i'm i'm a human at the end of the day there are some things i think when i get a lot of viral from trans people that is the bit that really really makes us think god damn i thought you were on my side here i thought you would right. you know and they're like no but you're being used by can't you see how stupid you are you're being used and They've got this they've got this fantasy in you in the head that we're you're being all gonna used. end up in camps. You're being used because they can't use you anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it it's all this sort of you're not in control of your own narrative and all this sort of thing. But me, Chloe, Helena, Limpida, Michelle, Alex, we all do our own thing. We are all operating independently. And what where what I think is happening is we're adapting the learning that we got taught in the trans community and turning it in on itself. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at trans activists, they're all very much uh, sort of the like sleeper cells that activate yeah. and pop up it's around It's a hive this. mind. It's 100% a hive yeah. mind and it's 100% a cult in my opinion. I think the trans shit is a cult. I, I think that and it was born out of something real, but it's become a cult. Yeah, and I mean, definitely I would say there is a risk there that detransition or detransitioner could fall into a new brand of that. Yeah. And what we're trying to do is stop that becoming a a brand or a community. It's like we do we do support each other. And the only reason our messages seem the same is because it's survivor bias, you know. We've all got that sort of um motivation to to want to do better for others. And you know, it's like and I don't want to fall into this. I don't want to be this person long term because there, there's only so much mileage in this personally for me. Um, I don't want to be sat here in two, three years time and still talking about the transition. I don't want to do that. That's not who I want to be. Um, I want to help 
detransitioners and help trans people where possible. Detransitioners are at the top of my priority, though. Everything else is secondary. Um, but I don't want to do this forever, and I don't think it's healthy to either. I think what I would like to do is, when the time's right, step back and let other people speak up, because I've said a lot. Um, and I'm hoping by me speaking, people get permission to speak too. And I do see that. And it is nice to see. But to go back to the question about the hatred, uh, I don't respect a lot of what's uh, being said, especially when it's like really viral. And also I've been using the internet since like 97, 96 or some shit. Um, 98 probably, a little bit old, about 11 I think I was, uh, when I had to be on internet connection. So I've said a lot of really horrible things to people online and I've, and I've had horrible things said to me. I've been in gaming groups and all sorts and males online can be brutal to each other and it's like yeah i kind of feel like i've been trained in a way uh and it's just like you, you know naturally thick skin and i just think that's kind of you either have it or you don't you know mm -hmm. um and you just it's just one of those things but also i don't really respect a lot of the hate that comes my way especially when it's from an app like an avatar that's an anime or yeah you consider the source theory. right yeah it it's depends consensual. depends who's saying it but when it's a trans person that i used to respect as a trans when i was transitioned right right that's, hard. that's like wow god i used to watch like i used to watch their content or read their content and now there's this big thing about us and and i'm just thinking damn that sucks i mean it really does i relate to that too you know obviously um, I'm pretty much the only trans YouTuber coming from like my personal political perspective. And so like, yeah, every once in a while I'll see like that trans person I respected when I was early on or even before. And I'm like, and they're saying something negative and I'm like, oh my God, what did I, what did I do? But you know what? That's the, the cost of, of speaking truth. And I think that's why a lot of people don't make the jump sort of to be open about their detransition story because you are losing yeah. an entire community of, of friends and camaraderie and, and community which humans are wired for even the most like intense individualist needs some sort of group or something to be part of you know that's kind of how humans work and it's just it's I, I wanted to ask you specifically before I forget um you mentioned that part of your sort of like arc here included some internalized homophobia and feelings about mm. being gay that you had that you feel may have played a part in everything that's happened so what did you mean by that so that it's not may have it it was a definite definite huge factor for me so growing up i was <laughs> i knew myself my family knew I was, I was soft i was effeminate i wanted to do ballet i wasn't like like totally flaming or anything as a kid you know what i mean but i was definitely not like my brother i was not like other boys and i realized early on because mainly it was to do with the environment you know like in the in the 90s in the uk it was it was still quite homophobic we're on the back end of the aids epidemic um and there was a lot of misinformation and propaganda about that so and also the area i was in wasn't really that welcoming for gay people so anyway the on that it wasn't okay and then you're watching media and stuff where they're always taking the piss out of gay people and you go to school and fag this um all this sort of thing and hopefully you don't get demonetized by youtube for me saying that but You're good. um yeah, i'm good <laughs> um so there was there was a great deal of it and there was those subtle bits in in the family it wasn't like my family were like gay bashers or anything like that but it was just stuff that would casually come up you know yeah. um Society and it was very very you that it, that was a lesser person being gay You're yeah a lesser person so at about i was always an anxious kid i was also very i was very easy to cry and stuff like that you know i was always bubbling i was always crying and uh i got really me anxiety condition the ocd i mentioned that really started badly at about age seven or eight like very that's where it just took off and by the time i got into my teens uh, the all CD was all about me being gay. So 
I would fall into this uh, ritualistic behavior, which is quite common in OCD, where you like you have to do a strange routine. It doesn't make sense to anyone but you. But if you don't do it, something terrible will happen. For instance, I had that. You too. would have to, yeah, you touch the like put touch certain parts of the wall, the lights, whatever. It doesn't make sense for me. I would compulsively pray, um, even though I'd like me me religious side was religion featured as a child um in the background of the culture but it wasn't like huge for me but as a teenager I just kind of evaporated and stuff but I was still compulsively praying and I was like I do not want to be gay terrified of being gay oh, wow. and um and I just could not accept it and it fucked me up for many years it led it it had a knock-on effect to everything else and you know as I said about all the the normal scrapes and scraps that you have in life, like you could normally deal with otherwise, mm -hmm. but everything on top of that was just, it just fucked us up. And I mean, um, I thought at the end of it, then I must be a woman because of all this, you know? Wow. Um, and it's quite enraging to me because the most obvious explanation for my case was highly anxious, had a lot of different comorbid issues, and um you know i was dealing with a lot of homophobia but that got palmed off as internalized transphobia and all this shit and here we are but um i think it plays a significant part in a lot uh a lot of it too but it's i don't want to i don't want to just say that all day trans males are people who are gay because we'll get a lot of straight guys who transitioned yeah. and now have now detransitioned um, so I don't want to like rule the the whole narrative and say that everyone's like me because they're not. There are some people who will literally detransition and they're back to being like your gym bros, right? Mm -hmm. As if nothing's ever happened. And but, it's really cute to watch. But, you know, there is something to the internalized homophobia thing. Um, and, you know, it's so crazy because obviously I've interviewed a lot of um, female detransitioners and I relate to them in certain ways, but... In a lot of ways, I don't because they were socialized female and then transitioned. You know, it's the the inverse of me, right? Um, yeah. But when I talk to you, there are so many small things that I notice we have in common, like the OCD, the ritualistic praying. I'm not religious, but when I was a child, I would always be praying for things. Like I was always had this impending sense of doom and I'd be like, God, please don't let my mom die in a car crash or please don't let me grow up and be alone. Like just weird stuff. Um, the OCD stuff. I'm the same about my mom as well. And, uh, wow. and I'm, I'm sorry, not psychoanalyzed, but uh my mother and father had a rocky relationship there's a lot of say it's it's almost scripted in a way like yeah and um, then you know i grew up with a lot of like bullying like i was called a faggot every day of my life and uh, i was questioned at a very young age why are you walking like that why is your voice like that why did you move your hand like that you know that kind of stuff and and there was i'm sure you know i haven't really gone back and, and analyzed it but i'm sure there was a lot of like maybe self-hatred that was happening on that front. And um, yeah. maybe even subconsciously when I came to the conclusion to transition, I don't know how much that really played a part into it or didn't, but there's something there. And I can see that when I talk yeah. to you, you know? Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that because that's a very real thing to say. And that doesn't mean that just because that's where you got to, that transition didn't work, right? Because mm -hmm. you're clearly thriving in your transition, right? I would say you are. Yes. You would say you are. Yeah. One hundred percent. I wasn't thriving. I didn't thrive in the way I wanted to. I I couldn't go. Like I was already anxious for going outside, but I just I couldn't. I, I I wanted in all the years I was desperate to be able to go out and like party and drink and shit. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it unless it was in someone's house. Wow. I just couldn't do it. And now I'm like, fuck yeah, let's go, right? You know, right. Um, and that's such a, a telltale sign, right? It's if life mm. doesn't become easier to live after transitioning, was it really the right decision for you? And I even what's the fucking point, you know? Right, like the way I the way I was measuring, and I don't know why other people maybe aren't as cognizant of this, but as I was going further along in my transition, I was checking in with myself and saying, like, is my life getting better? Is my life getting easier? Am I and and all across the board, everything became easier um, with some exceptions. Like there are still some pitfalls, like just on a social level of being perceived as a woman that you're not used mm -hmm. to and things change. And I'm sure you relate to that, you know, yeah. um, 
So yeah, if, if things are just going south, then that's, but it should never go south, right? You shouldn't get to the point where someone goes through these things and gets past medical professionals and still is able to go south afterwards. Yeah, and uh, one of the narratives is you lied to the medical professionals and it's like... Oh, give me a break. But then they encourage you to lie <laughs> if it means getting the hormones sooner because so, they want you to skip past the gatekeepers, you know? So, uh, and here's where I came in. So I really believed the trans shit was going to solve all my issues. It was going to make me happy as, as, you know, when you said when you went for the estrogen, this is going to make you the best you've ever felt. I believed all that too. I believed like this was the path forward. So to do it, I wanted to do it right. So when I said, when I talked to the, the psychiatrists and stuff, I give myself a hundred percent. I was totally honest and clear. <clears throat> I told them what I wanted, told them how I felt, everything didn't, didn't leave anything to guesswork because my idea was, well, this is going to fix me. So I'm going to do this right. Okay. So I need to tell them everything that, and people would say, oh, you know, if you want to do this, you can just like tell them that. And I was like, I didn't, I didn't want that. I wanted to get better. I wanted to be better. Um, so I, I, when I say I gave them everything from me heart, I did, I poured it out. I told them absolutely everything I possibly, um, was able to, um, and that's where it led me you know i had nearly 100 sessions with a gender therapist i had about 20 to 30 psychiatr psychiatrist sessions and i had sessions with a voice therapist and nurses at the gender clinic i had like over 150 sessions you know my paperwork is like 1200 pages long wow. from the gender clinic that's it's crazy. crazy there's there's no there's no lack of detail there and the the thing that made me think i'm gonna bring i'm going to see if i've got any legal case yet because I was, I was really upset naturally um the thing that really made me want to do that was reading back copies of my letters because i was like i fucking said that i said this i said this and wow. i was just like the more i read it the more angry i was getting you know because it was like i fucking told them you honestly richie i i know that i don't know what you're I don't know what the totality of your perspective on your experience is and how much onus you really put on yourself. But in my opinion, from hearing your story and not knowing all of it, because there are parts that you've chosen to not say, which is totally fine. From what I can see, you were very much failed. I think anyone who's going into these appointments and talking about these other issues they're facing and the fact that there's no prioritization to address those issues and work them through them before taking such drastic measures. I understand the setup was such that the clinics were set up to get you to that point, but that's not how it should be. If that's the case, and that's not how it should be. You were failed. I, there, obviously you made the, you signed off, right? Like you signed off, but I do believe you were failed along the way. I don't think, yeah. I, I don't th agree with putting onus on you for what happened to you, especially when it comes yeah, to the complications, you. you know, it's like you should have at least been given, you know, for lack of a better phrase, a quality product for what you for what you went through, you know what I mean, in the end, even if it was going to yeah. be the case that you were like, I shouldn't have got it at all. At least you should have been able to say, well, at least it functions and it's coordinate in coordination with my overall health. You know, you should have yeah. at least had that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you for saying that. I really, I really do appreciate that. Um, for me, one of the biggest betrayals in this was, you know how I mentioned about the OCD, about being diagnosed? Yeah. Everything, keep in mind, up until surgery, it was all like internalized transphobia, this, and internalized cis sexism, or the cis sexist society, and all this nonsense. And um, after surgery, the, this is the thing that fucked me off. I was pissed. I was angry. I was bitter because I shouldn't have went through it. And I said, I said to the therapist about four months after the initial surgery, because obviously I was, I was bedridden for like three months, like on my ass, it was completely, you know, and then I went back to the gender therapist and I said, the gender therapist, I think I've made a terrible mistake here. And I don't think this was right. And then he said, no, this is your OCD. You've just had this huge surgery, oh right? My God. And what he said was the anesthetic lowers uh, your serotonin 
naturally in your body that increases OCD ruminations. You're not experiencing regret. You've got bad OCD. You're a trans person with bad OCD. Disgusting. So I came back the next week and the next week and the next week. This went on for six, seven months. Eventually they went, your OCD is really bad. We're going to refer you for OCD treatment. Oh so they did that and then they discharged me and then it was goodbye. <laughs> that was it. That was the end of the story. So they'll ignore your other issues yep. up until the point they can utilize them to remove yeah. any responsibility for what the fuck they did to you. Absolutely yeah. disgusting. Like, yeah. And then there's, ugh, and then there's kids going through this. It just blows my mind. What's happening? Yeah. And it's, I mean, I was grown ass adult when I did this as well. I like, and this is the thing. People are like, you know, you you're an adult, take responsibility, and I'm like. You can still be a vulnerable adult. You can still have mental health yeah. issues. You know what I mean? You're not gonna there's a reason why that when you when you sign in certain legal documents, you have to be of a sound mind and stuff like that, you know? And it's like I kinda wish we we treat this with the seriousness it deserves. And we don't. We just treat it as if it's something that can be changed with a new set of hormones or a new set of surgeries. It's not, you know. But you know what's amazing? There's a lot what's amazing is how quickly it's escalated right because i transitioned yeah. um in 2015 2015 and at that time there was really no evidence that detransitioning was something that was even remotely common on the internet right and i don't even think it was due to censorship back then i think that you know there just genuinely wasn't as many public cases and 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 sort of sort of or certainly literally less cases, right? It's There's more junior searchers now than ever before. But it's like now we're at this point where it's on Disney Channel, where it's like safeguards have been removed rather than put up and, and, and improved. It's like this the fact that it can happen this quickly in just a few years is yeah. insane. Although it does give me hope that we can fix it quickly, perhaps. But at the same time, I'm like, how much farther is it going to escalate? Like, are we going to be giving like, dog sex changes next month i don't get it <laughs> i don't think so i hope not um we I, I think the way it'll work is as rapid as it came in it'll decline and it, the numbers already proved that that's happened um identity differences in 2020 and 2021 amongst lgbt youth and i'm talking youth i'm not talking 16 24 i'm talking like kids drastically changed like the numbers, like you're getting like high schoolers coming up now saying that they think this is a load of bullshit. Now, here's the thing. If the government is saying this is right and this is a great, right? As a teenager, your your whole shtick is to rebel against the system of the government. Right. But if they're all endorsing it, which is why the this is why you've got this new emerging group of very young people <laughs> who are pissed shit sick of this because they've Thank been false fed it. Yeah, it's just, it. I don't know, I don't know, I'm torn between, because um, I don't think you can like attribute this all to malice and engineering, but there are certainly a lot of mechanisms that have benefited from this, you know? Mm. Um, and, you know, there, there are a lot of people who have seen pound signs and it's just got to the point where it's got now and i think uh w path has a has a lot to answer for this too um mm. because there a lot of people lean on w path which is quite surprising yeah i mean listen it's been another hour and a half we did the same amount of link last time i feel like i could talk to you forever but unfortunately yeah. i can't um <laughs> Is there anything that you want to get out before we get off? Anything about who you are or what you want to accomplish, your intentions, just anything? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, very quickly, you know, my intentions is to get the right information done to promote some sort of international effort to get the research done by independents who are detached from this, detached from me, detached from trans people, detached from day trans, detached from... I know it's a big ask, but we really need that unbiased. We really need that scientific sort of, I don't have a stake in this, but I'm interested in it sort of thing. That's what I'm more interested in. And also the the awareness of how hormones, uh, just how important um, hormones are to your body. 
like your natal hormones like testosterone and estrogens um and the understanding around that because there isn't any so overall i'm looking i want to make things better ultimately for people who wish to do transition and transitioners you know they will benefit too from more information there's no yes there is no loss it's a win-win in my opinion and people will say that you know my message will get used and it will get um used by any like right wing outlet or whatever and i'm just thinking as long as it gets heard i don't care right well i mean you know how i feel about you i think you're extremely admirable and i just thank you for being so vulnerable in this interview and so open to talk about things that you know you have every reason not to talk about and if you wanted to delete all your socials tomorrow and say Blair can you take it down I want to be private forever like that would make a lot of sense too you know so mm-hmm. I thank you for taking these slings and arrows that you're taking and and thank you so much for coming on Richie no thank you Blair for having me uh did you get through all the questions by the way or is there still like 20 left there's like 20 left but you know what I'm gonna have this podcast for a while you'll definitely be yeah. back because we can talk for hours sure yeah I will do. all right Excellent see you Richie Blair. right thank you